All right, go ahead, Steve. And go ahead and introduce uh, yourself, please. Okay, Steve. well, I'm Steve Prevett. This is the Burnt Hills and Big Flats Railroad, of which you see the one by six staging board to my left. I do hope to uh, show you a few things on a PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. Uh, you know how we go. Uh, those of us engineers can't do anything without a PowerPoint. So uh, actually the Burnt Hills and Big Flats Railroad name has existed for 50 years. Today is my 61st birthday. So that tells you kind of when I got in on this, my parents got me a line L train set at about age five. Now let's see here. This should have ants. There we go. Now, whoops, back. Okay, I, I did do two HO layouts as a teen. One was a, the standard four by eight. My father helped me a lot with that. Uh, it's actually based on the magical mains, mainstay, which was in June 1970. And I have every model railroader since June 70. And we moved to a place where the four by eight went snake around to the basement and made a kind of a, a small version of the Knick Railway and Dock. After my father never understood why the thing didn't have an oval to run around in circles. It was a point to point, true point to point. Now, this is a very early picture of the end scale version. Once I got in the Navy, I uh, did actually gave away my HO stuff to a sailor and his son. And this is an early view of, I think an old Polaroid of the original three foot by six foot. Uh, I finished my first submarine tour, obviously didn't get a lot of construction done on that, but uh, moved to Monterey, California to get a master's degree in operations research. Now, those familiar with Monterey, you have John Allen. Now, 87 was long after John Allen was gone, but I did get to visit the basement. I did talk, get to talk with the folks who have all the uh, uh, memorabilia that just the NMRA is talking about. And this is quote unquote finished. I will say, you know, starting with a small layout and this three foot by six foot stayed in the layout till about three years ago and it was replaced. This is a three foot wide scene. Uh, when I moved to New London for department head school and then to Charleston, South Carolina for what turned out to be a last Navy tour, I had built uh, three additional modules, which you see in the right hand side of the layout in uh, Monterey and uh, fit these into a 10 foot by 11 layout. We had a, a regular operating crew in Charleston of three of us. Uh, Yes, this was all designed to be uh, dismantled, at least two guys helping me. I don't know the guy with the gray hair in the front, obviously he's reading a magazine while two people are working hard to take down the layout. <laughs> uh, this is the layout going up in Pasco, Washington. And notice the thing labeled new sections. Uh, so I set the 10 foot by 11 in a 14 by 15 room and then immediately started building new sections for it. So it did transition to a 14 by 15. And in 2009, it moved from Pasco, Washington back to South Carolina. So it did move from Charleston, South Carolina to Washington State and back to South Carolina. And I had become pretty good at how to box these things up. I think there's a picture, these pictures showed up in an OPSIG article about moving the layout, you see the bottom of the turntable is highlighted in that one rather odd shaped piece. I will admit the movers went, you expect us to move this? It's all odd shaped. And I said, yes, it's in my weight limit. I have no weight limit. <laughs> Uh, so there's the three by six in the driveway coming into the, the house now in Graniteville, South Carolina. That's the underside of it. And actually I did a big jigsaw puzzle with the boxes. Uh, you'll notice some moving boxes kind of in placeholders. I'd figured out a track plan. And fortunately I'd expanded from 13, 14 foot by 15 foot and into which had gone into another room eventually running joke was I get a hole. Uh, my wife wanted a koi pond in the backyard. I said, you get your koi pond hole if I get a hole in the wall. Uh, so this is uh, setting it up in uh, Pasco in 2009. And this is a good overview of it right now. Um, we have been shooting uh, Zoom sessions. A few folks that are on this have watched a few of the operating sessions. This is the uh, video camera that you're looking at me right now when I have it mounted on the wall. So it gives you a good overview of the layout itself. And this, the centerpiece here, which says Scranton and Kapow Branch in Franklin, New York, that's where the old three foot by six foot was. 
And in fact, that only took a weekend. I had pre-built those modules. It took a weekend to remove the uh, three foot by six foot and plug in these modules, get the legs on them, uh, clamp them together, wire them up, and we had them all ready for the next op session. Didn't lose an op session in that. Um, do want to say Ken Nelson back in Scotia, New York. Uh, actually allowed junior high school students to uh, operate his railroad. So you know, I'm very uh, in debt to him. Uh, did get to be with the Gorian Defeated Gang, although long after John Allen. Uh, in through that, I managed to meet John Armstrong on a temporary duty to Washington, D.C., and also Whit Towers, who was in the PCR at the time. Many, many others. I'll say I'm always impressed with how people with sharing people are and the various people that I even know that are watching today. Uh, I will say I did do portability. So I'll give you the, uh, the sales pitch there. I did have a completed layout quickly, as you saw, was able to apply lessons to later sessions. I didn't have to abandon and restart. In fact, we moved into the house in August. We had the first oper se operating session on the full layout in October. Uh, you can take the module piece. I mean, these aren't really modules, they're sections, but you can take the section, flip it up, wire the back of it, take it outside to do the dirty work for scenery, stuff like that. Um, I will admit I went to a smaller radius. It's all a uh, 12 inch nominal, a few 11 inch radiuses and end scale. I would have probably preferred 15 in retrospect. And you do have to watch the track alignment between sections. And yes, you do end up with a lot of maintenance issues. Actually, during the COVID down period, I spent, uh, I actually operated the railroad for 48 fast hours, 24 real hours myself, which sure wrung out a lot of maintenance issues. Uh, over the years, I've made it, went from the freelance Burn Hills and Big Flats, Burn Hill, my family had moved from Big Flats, New York to Burn Hills, New York in 1970. So the name make perfect sense to me. It probably is along the line of like a Gorian defeated these days, but uh, Burn Hills and Big Flats, although sounds a little screwy, uh, does have some meaning to me. I did pick up on the New York, Ontario and Western, living in upstate New York, had been on Route 17, saw the historical markers. And one of the more interesting things right now is I've learned a lot about the Derrico Holding Company. And I chose in June 1970 to do my time period with, and that turned out to be the height of Derrico. So I can legitimately run, if I assume my offshoot of New York, Ontario and Western became part of the Derrico, I can run Erie Lock, Alana, Delaware, and Hudson, and Burn Hills and Big Flats locomotives pretty much anywhere. Caboose is the works. Uh, that's kind of how the EL and the Erie Lock, Alana, Delaware, and Hudson worked. Of course, I have a little more anthracite mining than was uh, you know, reasonably historical in 1970, but oh well, it's my railroad. Uh, this is the basic I, a schematic. I do have a clipboard that I learned this from some guys in Atlanta. I oh, you this nice little schematic that you can kind of follow along where you're at. And that is the map of what is represented. I will just point out, notice there is a lot of interchanges, the Penn Central, the Erie Lackawanna, the Central New Jersey, and they're all uh, represented. Uh, as it says, we have now a fort, we have plenty of interchange traffic which is kind of important for justifying the operations. Uh, for the person who was asking about module layouts, another option is tab on car. We folded over little cardboard tabs and just before the op session, go and sprinkle them around the railroad, you know, making sure that, well, a coal hopper gets a tab that's reasonable for a coal hopper. But in end scale, it's a great boon because you don't have to read your reporting marks. And you don't have to carry all that paperwork around. So it is a non-realistic thing, but it sure makes a play value a lot higher. And I did run an article in OpSig about how the spreadsheet works, where I just randomly say, well, this isn't a boxcar that needs a tack. It's online. And I uh, go so that that, and Was that that Markov train traffic yes, generator? The, yeah, okay. that's, that's the Markov train yep. generator. If you're a, uh, for everybody listening, if you're an OpSig member, uh, oh, you can go to the April 2020 issue and read that article. Um, 
because as an OPSEG member, you've got access to all of our old issues. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. In fact, in this picture, you see the operator aid that's in the nuclear power we call signs operator aids. You'll see an operator aid that shows what color tax go to what track. And that the operator aid is for the the yard that's closer to you across the Lackawanna River. It's four tracks as a track. It's the stuff going south of Mayfield Division Point. And one track's black EL, one's brown, one's white, and one is black LV for Lehigh Valley. And you notice the color, the rainbow colors all go over to the main yard that is northbound traffic. So it's very easy to look at a yard track and go, is it classified or not? Very easy for visitors to pick up pretty quickly. Uh, I do, I have to admit, Andy, Andy Sprandio, who I got to meet, he's another great guy, was another great guy, is probably rolling around in his grave, but I don't dictate train orders. So the, we, I have pre-formatted Form 19s. Yeah, oh my, oh, oh, oh. And what's, what, how do you cross yourself? I'm in a mirror, I'm not too- Nah, you're, you're among <laughs> friends here, it's, it's all good. <laughs> but so it's always June the 5th, 1970. Now that happens to be when I started the HO Railroad, June the 5th, and I won't say what year, also happens to be my wife's birthday. So a little po political, um, <clears throat> it's always June the 5th. Uh, I found an old typewriter font uh, for computers, so it kind of looks like an old typewritten form. Uh, and so this is like a pre-stage thing. I have a stack of them. Uh, in fact, we're ju I'm just in between op sessions. So here's the stack of form 19s for a whole day. This is six operate. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't get them all. Uh, this is six operating sessions worth of uh, form 19s. Now, we, one thing, and I'll show you when we do the tour, we went to manual block control south of Mayfield. One, nobody wants to be dispatcher. So I made a, a tower job that controls the manual blocks, which are three, south of Mayfield. And they have these cards. That, this may or may not be prototypical, but notices as train moving is authorized, follow your manual block indications, turn this form into the CJ tower operator upon arrival at Big Flats. May or may not be prototypical, but clearance form A's had all sorts of strange information on them. I did load that up with where does it start? It starts at Mayfield and it terminates on the Sibley main uh, staging track. So I've got stuff in here. I got the DCC number. It may be engine 292, but it's in consist 283. So I, I put some model stuff onto the clearance form A to make it handy for the operators. And it, it looks fairly real. Okay, yeah, I did, I talked about, I did my maintenance time with COVID, so I put that to good use. In fact, I work on the Savannah River nuclear site, and since the last week of March, I've spent actually four hours on that site. I have the, I have a computer job, I do Markov chain operations research sort of analysis, so I'm working at home. I will say several years ago, a headhunter tried to recruit, recruit me to be an operations researcher for one of the big four railroads. And I, I kind of gulped hard, but I said, well, how can I do my hobby and have operating sessions at home and have to design operating sessions for a real railroad? That might just be a busman's holiday. So as it turned out, in pursue it. Uh, I'll show you the COVID curtain we have across over the yard because there's operators on each side of the aisle. We do do mandatory mask. And actually with a smaller crew, I have found the op sessions have been smoother because when we go to a full crew, people are kind of stepping over each other at times. Uh, there is a three lane highway I'll show you that is part of the replacement of the three by six session. It builds in a continuous run connection in the open and builds in a loads in empties out. And that's just best to show you on the video cam on the cell phone. Uh, so let me switch over here to the cell phone. I'm going to stop sharing here. And uh, hopefully Eric can help me uh, assist uh, shifting over. I'm gonna mute this mic. I kind of rigged, uh, do you hear me, Eric? Yep. Okay, so I kind of rigged up a little uh, bracket so I wouldn't make a lot of noise with the cell phone. 
But this is where I was sitting. It is the dispatcher's office. So I've got all sorts of my nuclear grade operator aids, the timetable, a stack of empty uh, form 19s if I have to write additional orders, a little cheat sheet on train order forms. Starting at the north end of the railroad, and I'm gonna turn on the railroad so we have a little more lights. This is a one by six board that's about 12 foot long. So in N scale, I've got five staging tracks, each two train lengths long. It is uh, serial staging. And the train hey. then comes into Sydney. You actually will see remnants of the old railroad. Uh, the old railroad, uh, that those openings were for the staging yard that's currently on the one by six. Hey, so Steve. with the new room, I was able to move that out in the open. Steve, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, just a quick quick reminder when you're when you're doing the video, make sure you. Um, when you get to a position, stop and let the camera, it, it takes a second or yes, two for it, it to adjust. Yes. So just be real careful about that. Okay, I don't want to make anybody seasick, yep. sorry. Yep. Okay, so here we're stopped uh, at Sydney. This is the yard, which is an interchange with the Delaware and Hudson. This is not a crewed, this yard has no permanent crew, but locals come in here and drop off their cars as they finish their run and sweeper trains, which I think is, I don't use that term, but the Santa Fe does and some articles come through and pick up those blocks and then leave blocks for local trains. Uh, you do see the tower for the DNH interchange. And I'm gonna switch here a little bit. The interchange runs, the DNH staging, which is two tracks, runs along the back wall and goes behind these buildings and that hill. And you have a little bit of a switching area here in Sydney for the Sydney local. You'll notice a train that has come down near the end of the session. And this is a Delaware and Hudson transfer. It, there's its locomotives. And it will uh, have to run around the train in order to get into the Delaware and Hudson. And that's actually realistic. Uh, I do simulate a lot of traffic to the DNH, and Ken Nelson told me that the trains NE84 and 87, which ran over a number of Northeast railroads between DC and Portland, Maine, had to do so many runarounds at interchanges, they had a caboose at each end of the train. So I actually do simulate that. Uh, so all that train is solid blue tacks. Now I'll be pulling those and retacking them you'll notice that the cars that are in Sydney are all yellow tacked and that happens to be their yellow colors. I don't know why, whoop, I just lost my picture. There we go. Um, I don't know why a covered hopper went to the Eagle shipping. I think the tack fell out and that probably got put back in in the wrong car, but obviously a bad way bill. Now we're gonna come out of this aisle uh, which uh, this actually was the, uh, the, the wall between the two rooms in uh, Pasco. Now it's just a central backdrop. And the line runs by a gravel plant here. And along this, uh, at the high level here, to the end of the aisle, and here we come into that three track system that I talked about. Now, right now we're on the left hand track coming out of Sydney, heading for Burnt Hills. And behind, I'm going to walk over to it so you get a better picture of it, is the Edison number three power plant. So you, when you're on this left track, you will drop empties, which are on the back track going to the power plant, and you will pick up loads. And later, when we get to this same point, when we're south of Mayfield, that train will be picking up loads and setting out empties at the, and you probably can't read the sign, but it says Riverside. So that's the Riverside breaker. Get a little twisted around here again. We'll come on down. So there is a runaround track. There's a little mill here, if the camera will focus. So I'll get a little closer to it at Franklin, New York. So this is all new section, and the left-hand track on the curve is 90 miles away from the right-hand track. So we'll talk about that later. 
Uh, we'll go around this peninsula. And this is where we come out from the other peninsula, a little road bridge that is pretty well camouflaged with trees. I'd originally thought I'd put a siding here, but I kept this in an open countryside. If I turn around, hopefully fairly slowly, we see the rest of Burnt Hills, which is actually Walton, New York. Uh, this is only 12 inches wide right here, so it says you can do a lot in N scale. Uh, we have, which is prototypical for Walton, New York, it still exists, and if you buy breakstone yogurt, there's a breakstone plant that is in Walton, New York. So this is a fairly busy industry along with some of the others. Now, since it's a uh, front edge, I was able to give people a nice big sign. And I did put my breakstone sign for the switching spot. So this is an example of when you come in and you're looking at, I've got a red O car, where do I deliver it? Well, it's hey, the upper Steve, left hand industry. Can you zoom in on the, uh, the sheet there on the left? Okay, we get there, how's that? That's better. better. Just hold hold still for a second. Yeah, it's a little bit a little bit easier to see. Okay. And you'll notice the directions for which colors are northbound pickups and which colors are for southbound pickups. And the actual station sign has the mileage to Oswego and the mileage to Scranton, which is patterned after what the New York, Ontario, and Western put on their passenger stations. And since the town is kind of big, I walk over here and I'll hold on this a minute. This is the rest of town. Beeling Electronics, well, Jim Beeling was one of the operators in Charleston and he used to be a telephone, a Bell Telephone employee. So we have Beeling Electronics. It's a rather complex area, but it has three different runarounds and it is fairly close to the actual arrangement in Walton, New York. Uh, this is the, uh, I'll kind of hold that a minute or two. There's the actual Beeling plant and some of the scenery work we do here. You can see the thumbtacks in the cars. And there is the uh, Delhi branch. You'll notice up on the backdrop, I have a big old sign that says Delhi branch. And I've tried to put these backdrop signs so that people can, they're at eye level and people can see them. All right, we're about, uh, hey, Steve, we're just about out of time. Oh, okay, uh, so, so wanna... that gives you an idea of some things while I'm yep. here. There's the Mayfield Yard. Yep. And uh, hopefully that gave you a pretty good overview of what's happening. Right. And the th uh, somebody did ask how large are the thumbtacks? They are just standard. Here, I'll pick one up here. Whoops. <laughs> it's just a standard everyday thumbtack. And yes, right. they have a 1 16th hole in the car. Okay. Uh, I guess I will turn it over to the other Stephen then. Thanks. All right. Uh, Somebody is asking if we could see the curtain. So your your COVID curtain, oh, yes. I guess. Yeah, there is the COVID curtain. You see the yard, there's an operator on both sides of the aisle. So I took an old, uh, I think it's an old paint drop cloth and just set it to the ceiling, got some better clear things at the bottom. So that if you're standing here as the coal yard operator, you're not breathing across at the person the other side of the railroad. That's a good idea. Good idea. And obviously masks for everybody. That's, yes. Uh, I, I just don't see any, any excuse not to, but if you do it properly, you can still, you can still uh, play trains. So um, if there's any, anybody else have any questions for Steve? I don't see any in the chat. Um, yeah, somebody so suggests. Yep. Yep. All right. Set. Okay. Thank All right, you. Steve. I appreciate you presenting. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the the other Steve. Let me let me find his uh, find his window here. All right, uh, Stephen Sprinkle. Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and take it away. Hi, I'm Stephen Sprinkle. I live in Marietta, Georgia and I'm retired and uh, 
tell you a little bit about something I worked together quickly. So let's see if we can share a screen. Okay, I hope everybody can now see the overview. Yep. Looks good, Steve. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is a simple and continuous operating scheme for a model railroad that's designed for switching and for operating sessions. Though, frankly, due to COVID, I haven't had an operating session lately. But I had certain objectives when I built this railroad. I started on it a year and a half ago in January. I actually had a predecessor model railroad, which has uh, disappeared due to a divorce. So I had to start all over again. Uh, but my objectives in the new model railroad is I wanted ultra reliable operation. I wanted not to have to do any setup to start an operating session. Basically, you could start an operating session anytime you wanted. I wanted plenty of room for people to walk around without bumping into each other. I wanted something complex enough to keep people interested for at least three hours. And I wanted to make it senior citizen friendly. In terms of the basic design, the room is 21 by 17. It's an around the walls design of 14 by 17 and the remainder is a viewing aisle along one edge. It's got a single track main line. It's actually two loops that cross over each other at a level of crossing. The track is dead level, um, mainly because I want to, there's lots of industries and you can drop freight cars almost anywhere. You don't want them to roll away. I use reachable manual turnouts that are from Pico and reachable manual signal switches. Uh, there's a three foot lift out section that you can pick up to get in and out. The rail height is 40 inches off the floor, which is a compromise between low enough for kids to see and high enough for adults to enjoy. It's a transition era layout with both steam and diesel, nice short freight cars, 40 or 50 foot at the most. So it, it looks good and the curves don't look too tight. It has 16 industries. It has one recirculating track, which goes through a mountain to recirculate loaded coal hoppers from an electric power utility back to the coal mine. And the inventory is five locomotives, seven cabooses, 75 freight cars, one self-propelled passenger car and four subway cars. And actually it's now up to six locomotives. We just added one. And uh, by the way, the subway cars don't actually operate. They're on an elevated track that crosses over the main line and they simulate elevated train cars as they would have looked in places like New York City. This is the diagram. Let me see if I can give you a little pointer out of this. So blue, I'm sorry, no, green is the main line. So it's got a big loop, comes all the way back, crosses over itself and goes to a little loop. There are three passing sidings in blue, one on the left, there's one on the right, and there's one at the back. The two pink tracks are the locomotive service facility. The purple is the yard. The labels uh, haven't been updated lately, but there's actually four sortation tracks, an arri arrival track and a departure track. And then everything that's brown is an industry spur. So this industry spur is in the city of Cartersville has four industries on it. Mills is Mills, Whitley Foods, and Raymond Mats. Some of the spurs, like this one, come off a passing siding. Some of the spurs, like this one, come right off the main line. And some of the spurs come off a passing siding into a double-ended configuration. And even though this is one long track, it actually represents two spurs. One's going that way and one going this way. Uh, turnouts are manual turnouts, they're Picos. The ones that have red painted ties on them are only touched by the dispatcher or a tower operator because they affect mainline operations. The ones without red on them, the local crews will flip as necessary. And here's the switch, here's the signal lights that are used to control the layout. They have these little, these are actually pretty tiny slide switches. Uh, that are manually thrown to indicate something with the signal light. And uh, I use a car card system, which has been around for years. 
This is an example of a car card for a locomotive. So it identifies the locomotive with this info. I have glued to the back of every one of them what their uh, what the F buttons do because they're slightly different. They're slightly different uh, because of the different manufacturers of the locomotives. And then here's an example of what's used to represent a car. And this happens to be for a gondola. And then here's an example of a waybill that has four stations to it, basically four destinations that operate in sequence. This is the waybill in a car card. Uh, and this is a special waybill which represents a block of mine coal hoppers that always stay together. And this happens to be an eight-car block. The color coding is interesting. I've arranged everything so all turnouts are trailing point turnouts. So the service and industry does not require a run. Yellow means uh, that destination is serviced by trains going to the left around the layout. And orange means that location is served by trains going to the right on the layout. And here they are in their car card boxes. These labels are uh, stuck on with Velcro. And the reason is over time, I've changed the arrangements. I've changed the names of some of the towns. I've added some industries. So I don't have to do anything destructive to change labels. The labels just peel off and I put new ones on. So basically what this means is, this is American hardware is the location. This car card with this waybill in it represents a car that's been delivered that's not ready for pickup yet. But this box with an arrow means it is ready for pickup and it needs to be picked up by a train going to the right. And so here's a car that's going to be picked up. Now, interesting, you might say, well, why is that card marked yellow if the box is marked orange? And what this means is this location, American, is served by trains going to the right. Ultimately, this car has to be delivered to a different location on a train going to the left, which means it has to go to the yard, be sorted, and get onto another train. This is what I make the labels with. It's real easy. And you can get all sorts of colors of labels. And so my boxes on my layout have represent all sorts of things. So I've got boxes for sortation tracks, arrival, departure. I've got boxes representing to represent trains in progress, uh, et cetera. Now, some of my waybills I have designed for what I call continuous industry progression. So for example, uh, pick up grain from a grain elevator and deliver it to a flour mill. Same car, pick up flour from the flour mill and bring it to a commercial bakery. Then pick up from the commercial bakery to deliver goods to the food wholesaler. And then from the food wholesaler back to the green elevator. This just shows how I've made the boxes. I bought, bought these off from Micro Mart and spray painted them. I keep uh, my uncoupling devices at each end so that they're easy to get to. These are the instructions for the layout. There's basically five pages, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we actually operate it. So there's a number of roles. There are engineers, there's conductors, there's a mainline dispatcher. There's something called a marsh tower operator. The word marsh refers to the fact that the tower is near a salt marsh on the layout. There's a yard master and there's a freight manager. And I've actually added one since I wrote this page. There is a uh, specific engineer that works under the yard master running a switching and locomotive. So engineers, they operate the locomotives using wireless throttles or mobile phones, everything's wireless. They follow directions from the conductor that can either be oral or using hand signals. Uh, there's a specialty engineer in the yard who just runs the yard switcher under the direction of the yard master. His job is to assemble trains and disassemble trains. And I let the engineers either be inside the layout or out. Now I have stools on the outside. So if you're a senior citizen and you want to sit, you can sit on the outside and just wait for directions from your conductor as to what to make your locomotive do. Um, this just happens to show one of my locations. This is a passenger terminal. This is a uh, self-propelled passenger car called an RDC that runs by itself. This one's kind of a special job just a single person is both the engineer and operator for it and basically operates continuously uh, going back and forth to the station. So it puts traffic on the line without much switching. Uh, this is my switching locomotive uh, under, that operates under the direction of the yardmaster. 
the conductors, they do the paperwork. Uh, basically, when, they, when cars are delivered to an industry or delivered to the yard, uh, car cards are placed in the boxes that do not have arrows, meaning they just sit there initially. Uh, when they get to an industry, they pick up cars and cards uh, from the boxes that have arrows, meaning they're ready for pickup. And anything you pick up goes back to the yard. We don't do any direct delivery. So you get set out with the cars you're going to deliver. Everything you pick up, you bring back to the yard. This, engine, this uh, conductor holds the deck of car cards. And there's a locomotive card on top, typically five to 11 car cars, that's the length of the train. This works for this layout. If you had long trains, if you had 30 car trains, I don't think car cards would work. It'd be too much stuff to hold in your hands. Um, also, with respect to turnouts, those that are not marked red, the crews themselves flip to the direction they need to put them. And the conductor does that. He directs the engineer when and how to move the train. He requests permissions from the mainline dispatcher for mainline operations, and he requests permission from the yard master to enter or leave the yard. Um, and the railroad owner, that is me, uh, moves car cards for any train movements made between operating sessions. So basically, the cards are always in place where they belong. And if I move a train or a car, I move them. If my friends come over just messing around, they actually use the car cards. So there's no setup. The cards in the boxes always represent the physical reality of the layout. There's a mainline dispatcher. He directs all train movements outside of the yard and outside of the locomotive service facility. He flips the turnouts that are marked red. He sets, all, he sets signals and he directs the Marsh Tower operator to help with turnouts and signals. And what it basically is, one of them's at the back of the layout and one's at the front. And that way things are pretty much within arm's reach. Uh, the Marsh Hour Tower operator follows the mainline dispatcher directions. He flips turnouts, he turns signals. He just happens to sit outside the layout and he can be on a stool if he wants, which is nice and relaxing. The yard master directs the switching engineer to disassemble arriving trains and to assemble departing trains. We do block the freight cars by destination. So on a given train, all the cars for a given destination are next to each other. He decides what length trains he wants. He assigns locomotives, cabooses, and crews to trains. He grants permissions for trains to come in to, for arrivals. Uh, he directs locomotives and crews to the locomotive service facility, which has sanding tower, uh, diesel fuel, coal, water, etc. And he can be on a stool, or uh, actually he's on a mobile stool that's on wheels inside the land. There's somebody called the freight manager. He basically keeps the car cards in circulation in the boxes along the edges of the layout. So he will from time to time look for cars that have been sitting a while. He'll pull them out, move the waybill to the next destination, and move the yellow car card to a pocket that has an arrow on it indicating it's ready for pickup. So he moves them from non-arrow boxes to arrow boxes. He also recirculates loads. The flat cars have loads that are realistic looking. And when he delivers it to a location, he takes it out, puts it in the yard at that location. Uh, from time to time, he takes things from destinations back to origination, so they recirculate. Um, and in my experience, it kind of works best, provides the most interest, if you do not pick up every single car that's in an industry when a train comes by. Let it be somewhat realistic. You know, be some cars ready for pickup and some that needs to stay still, and they can do a little bit of sorting right in the yard, right at the uh, spur. Uh, this is an example. Oops, let me see. Here. Yeah, this is an example of one of my loads. This is a load I have not figured out what to do with because they're somewhat fragile, and so in theory, scrap metal goes to a steel mill, and you should be able to take that out and then have an empty gondola go back somewhere. But every time you take it in and out, it starts to fall apart. So I always have loads in my gondolas, even when they're supposedly empty. I have not found the solution for that. And this is just a picture of the guys doing an operating session. Um, so uh, this, this is the marsh here, the marsh tower operators right here. This is the yard back here with a yard master. Uh, here's a train crew, here's a train crew, here's a train crew. And here's some observers around on the front. And that's the whole story. 
That's great, Steve. It looks like a, is that like a bonus room over a garage or something? Or Yeah, I had yep. two requirements for my home. One was due to my hobby, one was due to my age. So I wanted a master bedroom on the main and I wanted a, oh, a room big enough for a model railroad. So yep. this is a 21 by 17 foot room over the garage, which I like better than my previous layout, which was in a basement and dark because it actually has some windows. Yeah, yeah, there's... And, uh, we did some nice lighting. These were these cans are all LEDs, and these pointable ones are all LEDs. So I got twenty pointable lights. There is no dark spot anywhere on the layout. Yeah, those. I was going to say if those were, if those were the old incandescents, this I could imagine how hot this room would get. But with yeah, LED, it's, it's like there's nothing. <laughs> yeah, and it has its own separate little air conditioning heating unit it's an odd machine it's from mitsubishi it's called a split mini i've never seen one before this like i've heard of those They're yeah it works reasonably units, well so all right um burr is asking how wide is the inner aisle it looks like so in here so yep. this dimension let me see if i can remember which dimension is which so this dimension wall to wall is 17. inside is probably about uh 13 and this dimension from wall to wall is 21 but i only use 17 for the layout internal to layout it's about 12. so you got about 9 by 12 of free space in the inside one of the big issues i faced in design was did i want to make a peninsula and i ultimately decided not to even though it would provide more operating interest because then people would have to circulate around the peninsula and keep bumping into it yep. this way even though it looks like a lot of people they really don't get in each other's way. There's plenty of room in there. Yep, you'd end up with a choke point there. So I'm assuming you have to duck under to get into the middle, or is there a lift-up section there? It's a somewhere? three foot lift-out section. Okay. And it has my greatest engineering failure. I designed this on a CAD system. I sent it to my friend who's in my model railroad club, who's also a cabinet maker, and he made the woodwork. And he did a great job. I have a rollout shell, I'm shelving underneath. I have a rollout desk in the back that you can work on. And the front part, I wanted to make narrow for the lift out. So the lift out is 36 inches wide. Uh, my intention was to have a lift out that was only eight inches deep. There was a typo in my CAD that I sent Ooh. And the typo yeah. said 18 inches. Ouch. So this lift out is 36 by 18, which makes it a bit heavy and unwieldy. I really only wanted 36 by eight. Right, eight would be, eight's easy. 36 is a little bit more work. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, 36 is wide either way, but it's right. well, yeah. 18 deep. So that's why I had to invent the marsh here. I need to put some something to cover up the extra space. Nice, nice. So that was the only engineering flaw so far. All right. Um, and Burr's follow-up question, is there any staging? And it looks like no. It's, no, it's my, just my view of trains is everything that, that, I had, that I want to operate will always be visible. Nothing's hidden. So effectively, there's a yard. Everything circulates back through the yard. And you know, trains get assembled and disassembled using the drill track and the arrival departure tracks in the yard. So everything that's going on is visible and everything that goes on yep. looks like it would, would really happen in a short line railroad. So what's, the, what's your fleet size here? Do you, do you rotate cars in and out or is pretty much everything on the layout? Everything is always on the layout. It's 75 freight cars, six locomotives. OK. And it, they're all on the layout. Now, the trains obviously change every moment. Oh, of course, of course. Train, you service. Then you come back, and then in the meantime, the yard master and the switching guy have assembled a new train for you. And it happens to have in it whatever the car cards say was next to go out. Now, the, the yard is single-ended, so the right-hand end of the yard is all stub tracks. And you have to take the cars off the far right because those are the ones that have been waiting, waiting the longest to get out. Uh, for everybody listening, uh, Stephen provided a YouTube link to his a uh, little bit more detail of his layout, uh, so you can see all the industries kind of just walking around the, essentially walking around the oval. Um, he's got some gorgeous, gorgeous scenery in there. Um, be sure to, t I've put a link in the chat, so be sure to take a look at it, throw him a like. Um, so are there any other questions for Stephen? Got a quiet group here today. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Stephen, thanks so much for presenting. That was a, 
uh, You're welcome. the idea that that continuous, you know, never ending session. I think that's something I like about the um, the system that I I wanted to do the same. Th oh, I just saw your subway cars. Those are awesome. I love those. Oh, where'd you see them? It's in your uh, in your YouTube video here. I have it running on the other screen. Oh, yeah. So. Well, let me exp I'll just explain one more thing quick. So there are things that I wanted to show, but which I couldn't make operate reasonably. I didn't want to have a multi-level layout. So I actually have subway cars that are on elevated train tracks that cross the main line at a right angle. Yeah. And I just finished a um, Central just... Valley Model Works um, 200 scale foot truss bridge. And so I have passenger cars as a stationary display going over that. Yeah. Um, I've got, I, these you should be able to, passenger cars. can you see those? Can you see my screen right now? Yes, I can. Okay. So just for everybody's benefit, that's the, uh, what he's talking about with the elevated track there. That's, that's just great. So, all right. Well, again, Stephen, thanks so much for presenting. Um, You're welcome. We'll go ahead and, on spotlight you here and